Did women in Europe wear underpants in the Middle Ages? Stay tuned for a fun romp through evidence for and against. Do you want to start an instant polemic, perhaps even a physical altercation in the medieval reenactment world? Then mention the subject of women's underwear and boom, instant caged grudge match. So why is the topic so contentious and what is the evidence for women having not worn what we understand as underpants? As to the first, I do not really have an answer, but the subject tends to explode on any given social media conversation where it crops up, akin to the topic of gun ownership, COVID vaccinations, and women's reproductive rights. But I digress. As for the second, what is the evidence for women having not worn them? I've asked around and it seems that it is a lack of evidence for women having worn them, above all in the visual record, along with certain laws requiring certain kinds of women to wear underwear and church sermons decrying the practice. So, did women wear underwear in the Middle Ages? My super helpful answer? Possibly, depending on where and when in that 1,000 year period of history. And note that for the purposes of today's discussion, I shall be utilizing the medieval terms bre and trues interchangeably and uh, also the term underpants, just for linguistic variety and interest. Here is some of what I have found thus far with the caveat that my research is ongoing. You can thus make the call for yourself. I know, not my usual overly assured self-confidence, hashtag Contessa indecision. First off, let me say that my research thus far is focused on the period from 1300 to 1500 in modern day France, Italy, Germany, and Austria. Medieval Spain, being the multicultural, multi-religious melting pot that it was for most of that period, it's its own entity and one that I may delve into at a later time, but for now we shall leave the Iberian Peninsula undisturbed as the eternal medieval exception that it is, sort of like the Mongols but I digress. Disclaimer, medieval Europe was not a monolith. Your mileage may vary based on your era and geographic region. So with that understanding, lasate ogni speranza voi che entrate. Just kidding, or maybe not. Let us start with the visual evidence. A lot of the visual evidence of women in undergarments can be classified into the categories of mythical, legendary, or allegorical. Hence why these sources are often dismissed out of hand as not providing proof positive of medieval women actually having worn bre. Let us look at a few of these and discuss them. For instance, here is a depiction of Semiramis with her stepson lover and the three women who try to tempt him from her. And here is another slightly different version, also a German woodcut from the same era. It could be claimed that the underwear depicted here are explicitly intended to refer to prostitutes and therefore to indicate the sinfulness of these women. But that reading does not quite fit the medieval understanding of that tale. The three women might be temptresses, but they weren't considered prostitutes. Another potential interpretation is therefore that in presenting them in just underwear and the open robe, they are heathen. After all, ancient women were often perceived by medievals as walking around semi-nude, exposing private parts willy-nilly. This particular choice of ensembles may be reflecting what 15th century readers and artists understood to be underclothing because it is actually what women in general wore, not just prostitutes. These woodcuts could also be depicting them as wearing what medieval people may have perceived as lingerie, bedroom clothing intended to seduce the sun away from Semiramis, which to my mind does not preclude this as something that actual 15th century women may have worn as well, even though the idea of lingerie is, as we understand it, is of course a bit more modern, but not necessarily entirely. After all, these braids look exactly like Bray in which actual 15th century men and even a few women are depicted. There's nothing exotic or fanciful about their shape or ornamentation. Indeed, the sinfulness of the bre might not be that the women here are wearing them in general, but that they're wearing nothing but them in a provocative fashion. Akin to how it would be perceived were modern women to come strutting down the street dressed like this. And no, I'm, I'm not going to put a video demonstrating that, sorry guys. While we move on to some other imagery I have unearthed in my Herculean labor, please take a brief moment to like this video and subscribe to my channel. And if you are interested in supporting such content as you find here, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon, which comes with a whole host of perks, among them discounts to my workshops and classes. Details in the description below. Okay, back to your regularly scheduled Contessa. This one is interesting because it shows a lady in a veiled and hooded henin attired in a unique translucent robe. If one looks very closely at her nether regions, one can see a pair of bray painted in there. See the bikini line? So, evidence of women wearing underpants? Well, let us take this illumination miniature in its context, shall we? 
This image depicts Queen Omphale, hence the curious diaphanous overgarment combined with the henan. The short version of the tale is as follows. As part of his labors, Heracles was indentured to Omphale for a year to serve her as she wished. She set him the task of spinning. To this artist, the veiled henan probably signified queenliness, while the seductive transparent robe-like overgarment requires their perception of attire of women in antiquity. Being a northern illuminator, it's possible they may never have beheld actual Greco-Roman mosaics or sculptures, and so used their imagination based on descriptions and other people's work. As to the Bre, this could be a situation in which the Bre underscore the subversive theme of Omphale dominating Heracles, i.e. a woman ruling over a man, highly threatening to men in this era, making this an argument against women having commonly worn Bre in this era. Or, the truths could indicate uh, that she's a legendary woman, and therefore also not indicative of what actual medieval Franco-Burgundian women wore. Or the artist could have chosen to depict her thusly because contemporary women wore underpants, and he thought the combination of translucent fantasy garment with the bray was particularly scintillating and heathen. How's that for a non-committal answer, eh? Ha, <laughs> good times. On a side note, the companion image to this one on the other side of the margin depicts Heracles nude holding a distaff, typical women's work in this era. Some would take this as a clear sign that women of this period were expected to not wear trues. But is the choice of visualization necessarily indicative of what medieval women actually did or did not do? We'll come back to this contentious question in a bit, for now. On to other imagery. Along the lines of subversive role reversal, another common image specifically from the late 15th century is the woman wearing the pants. Some people even use this turn of phrase in English to argue for the absence of intimate undergarments for women in the medieval period. However, Hachiman as they say in Korea, the abbreviation pants is not attested to in the English language until 1840 and was a shortening of pantaloons in any case. And the original expression was to wear the breeches, which arose apparently in 16th century English, and is in that era more likely to refer to the overgarment, not the undergarment, which is also what many of the sermons were preaching against, women wearing knee pants and breeches of the style that men were wearing in the mid 16th century, especially the famous cortegiane down in Italy. <laughs> Nevertheless, this set of imagery focuses on the subversive situation of a woman dominating a man, and one of the ways it does so is by showing the woman pulling on a pair of trues. This is also often interpreted as an argument against female undergarment usage in this era. However, Hachiman. <laughs> what if the issue is not wearing any sort of braise, but specifically the type of braise themselves? In the later 15th century, for instance, men's underwear becomes much more sophisticated to include models featuring pouches for all the little dangly bits. Many of these images I have found seem to depict this extremely masculine set of underwear, which might mean that the role reversal is not signified by the lady wearing bray at all, but by the specific genre. Another set of imagery where one will find women in underwear, commonly, is a fountain of youth scenes, in which elderly individuals are plunging themselves, or in some cases being plunged like sacks of turnips, with mad abandon into rejuvenating waters. Note that, as with many common motifs and themes, medieval illuminators and other artists tended to follow pattern books of stock imagery, hence why one may find multiple depictions of nearly exactly the same scene looking almost exactly the same. So, why does this artistic practice matter? It means that the frequency of the depiction of a particular style may not provide an accurate reflection of the frequency of the practice of the phenomenon in question in terms of quotidian reality. <laughs> How's that for a fun sentence? <laughs> in the case of the Fountain of Youth, there is often at least one woman wearing bre, but one might make the argument that they are wearing bre due to incontinence rather than as a common practice of healthy women. Hence, why the young ladies in the fountain are suddenly not wearing any underpants at all, even if they go into the fountain with them, while the men all are. It's like magic. Although in this fountain scene, the woman in Bray is not a decrepit old crone like the others. Note how she is not toothless, withered, and gray like the other obviously elder stateswomen here. I would thus debate whether her braids, her bray, 
are for the incontinence of age, although perhaps incontinence due to other medical issues such as damage from repeated childbearing over the years. Oh, the joys of being a medieval woman. The potential age of this underpants wearing lady aside, one could also make the argument that the young women in the fountain have been highly objectified and sexualized by a most likely male artist creating for a most likely heterosexual male audience and therefore presented naked. While by contrast, the men have not received the same treatment and are therefore modestly covered. So, why is the visual record not necessarily accurate when it comes to what women actually wore and considered to be standard in terms of clothing? As Sherry C.M. Lindquist notes in her paper, Visualizing Female Sexuality in Medieval Cultures, quote, the male clerical voice predominates in the record, distorting the visual representations of women, especially ones in moralizing or moralized imagery. She goes on to note, quote, even when we do encounter a Hildegard von Bingen, an Eloise, a Christine du Pizan, or a Marjorie Kemp, we are aware that their voices only come to us filtered through patriarchal structures. And this bias most assuredly applies to the visual record as well. So, even if the artists are non-clerics, or even in rare cases, women, their choices of depictions are heavily impacted by this paradigm. I would even suggest that morally virtuous women are depicted nude because this harkens back to pre-fall man, innocent and naive. Whereas morally corrupt women are depicted in Bray to recall the sinful Eve after eviction from paradise with her fig leaf trues. Along these lines, here is a 15th century fresco from Italy depicting the temptation of St. Anthony and the demon tentress who is tempting him by lifting her skirts and showing oh so scintillating knee length trues. This could again be an indication that she is sinful for wearing underwear, that she is sinful for wearing male style underwear, or that just showing the under things that women wore every day is sinful. So many potential interpretations, and not necessarily a hard answer here. This concept of pre-fall women being nude and sinful post-fall women covering their genitalia may also account for fountain of youth scenes in which young women are depicted nude. The implication may be that they have been restored to their pre-fall state of youthful innocence. So then, why are the men also still depicted in their underpants in these scenes? For one, there could have been an association between barbarism and exposed male genitalia, a concept that stretched back to the pre-Christian Roman Empire, hence all of those classical male nude statues with very petite bits. Moreover, it could have well been the convention to simply not show men completely nude. The artists being mostly men and often clerical, they may have simply shied away from the graphic nature of the phallus and testes. On top of all this, there may have been a double standard at play as well. Perhaps it was perfectly acceptable, perhaps even desirable, to depict women fully nude, fully accessible, and vulnerable to the male gaze, but not to do so for men. Film theory 401 sort of stuff. Freud could possibly have had a field day with this topic. Oh, in fact, I think he did, in any case. Of course, I've also considered that there might be a practical level to depicting men in Bray, but women not. Quite prosaically, it is easier to draw and or paint Bray than it is to draw and or paint male genitalia, whereas female genitalia can be represented with a simple line. So perhaps that played into the choice to generally show women nude, but men in Bray. Just amusing I have, and one I have noted from sketching, painting, myself, but this is not backed up by any specific evidence, so I'm just putting that out there. Final note on the potentially suspect nature of the visual record in this regard specifically. Consider the vast discrepancy between very selective visual representations and the reality of day-to-day -day life in our own modern world. If people 1,000 years from now were to base their reactions of our fashion, re excuse me, recreations of our fashions and beauty standards on the imagery found in publications such as magazines and even on the web, consider all those highly sexualized, highly stylized selfies floating about, or even the way women have been depicted in mass publications, such as, oh, I don't know, Penthouse and Playboy, the result would be, well, extremely skewed and not at all representative of the day-to-day -day reality, especially as to the nature of quotidian undergarments commonly worn. Well, 
With all of that information, your brain is probably spinning and you are wishing to think about anything other than undergarments and gender theory and the Middle Ages. So what are your thoughts thus far? Where do you stand in this debate? Let me know in the comments below, but please do try to keep it respectful. Coming up, we will discuss the scintillating documentary evidence for medieval women, excuse me, documentary evidence for medieval women owning and wearing underpants, and also discuss my personal living history experience on both sides of this very pointy fence. Until then, stay creative and stay tuned for your moment of kitty zen. Our first family meal. <laughs> On our last thrilling episode, we explored some exciting or maybe frustrating evidence for women covering their loins and discussed the potentially problematic nature of the visual record. So, if the visual record may be suspect in either direction, what's left? Thankfully, documentary evidence of medieval women owning, inheriting, and even wearing braids does exist. For the purposes of this video essay, which is rapidly working its way towards a doctoral dissertation, we will be discussing actually five primary textual sources, some more disturbing than others. Rape cases from France, household account books who got paid to do what, wills from Italian city-states, and Italian inventories. This is just what I found thus far through only semi-serious searching. If anyone wants to fund me doing this full time and are really taking a deep plunge, let me know in the comments. In the meanwhile, I do expect more evidence to turn up as my search continues into other regions of Europe and as more information gets digitized. So let us turn our attention to criminal records. Trigger warning. The next section will cite matter-of-effect counts of sexual assault. So please skip to the next chapter or section if you wish to issue exposure to such content. First up is a rape case that was brought before the magistrate of Saint-Martin-du-Champ in the 14th century. Quote, on that day, Jeanne Ogne, tailor of gowns, staying at the corner of Rue Garnier and Saint Ladre, in the town home of Henri Ogne, forced said Perret, the plaintiff, to enter a cellar against her will, and by force, and threw her to the ground, and took off his her braise, and put her under him, and forced himself against her nature in the manner he could. Now, this Middle French is somewhat ambiguous. I've talked to two different specialists in the language, and one says that the French could be referring to the rapist removing his victim's prey, or to removing his own, but more likely his own. While the other specialist feels it clearly refers to his victim's prey. Like all Romance languages, French possessive pronouns do not reflect the gender of the subject, but rather the object. So the word ça could be either his or her. I therefore leave it to you to decide. But the next piece of documentary evidence comes from a satirical romance from the 13th century, the Roman du Renard. It's an anthropomorphic twist on courtly adventures. The protagonist, more of a dastardly anti-hero really, engages in all sorts of mischief, some of it rather horrifying. In one of the tales, he rapes the wife of his enemy and is brought before the king to stand trial. He defends himself in the usually repulsive manner, saying, I cannot hide the fact that I loved his wife, but since she never complained and I did not pull off her truce, nor break into her house, nor break down her door, if I was dear to her and she loved me, what is this jealous fool claiming? The jealous fool in question, by the way, is her enraged husband. Of course, he's most assuredly not suffering from a jealous fit of rage, but rather righteous wrath. But I digress. This very clearly indicates that part of being raped includes having a woman's trues forcibly removed. And I've encountered several other real-world medieval French cases where this was specifically mentioned as proof of the woman's victimhood torn in bloody clothing along with physical injuries. I have a feeling that a closer scouring of literature from the Middle Ages might reveal more such passages, and as documents become increasingly digitized, such evidence might come to light sooner rather than later. So let us turn our attention to an uplifting source of evidence for a wide variety of clothing, last wills and testaments. Well, at least it's happier than rape cases, eh? For instance, one will from 1368 in Italy features some really interesting tidbits. It has a listing for a shirt and three pair of new mudande, trues in English, and then two line items below it lists, quote, item, seven old shirts and nine pairs of trues, and the sleeveless fustano da femmina. Now, the phrasing of this could imply that everything in the line item involves women's garments, which would make more sense than piling together 
on a somewhat random grouping of clothing into one line item, especially when almost exactly the same sort of items have already been mentioned two lines above. I think the distinction is very much meant to be male versus female, with male listed above and female itemized below. Okay, if you're enjoying this video, then please take a moment to like and subscribe and hit the bell, and even maybe consider becoming a patron on Patreon to support such content going forward. Comes with perks such as discounts on my classes and workshops. Okay, enough shameless plugging, back to your program. Another will from Italy in 1367 makes specific mention of mudande dieci da omo, men's trues, ten pairs. Why would they waste precious vellum and ink specifying the gender of the trues if only men wore them as a general rule? If there are men's trues, that implies that there must be women's as well as a common occurrence, at least common enough to have to specify male versus female. On an interesting note, one inventory of items belonging to Lucio Contanto a Moise, taken in Italy in 1348, features a pair of trues lined in cotton batting. Because this was an inventory of her belongings, one might assume that the clerk felt no need to specify the default gender of the garments because, well, it was a woman's inventory. So, in fact, no men's garments are mentioned at all in her will. Now, these could be a pair of trues intended for a woman's menses, or one can argue that they're for incontinence and therefore not reflective of what a healthy young woman might have worn on a regular basis. Fair enough. Much to your probable annoyance, I therefore leave it to you to decide. Is this evidence of women having worn underwear as a regular course of action or not? But fear not, more concrete evidence is at hand. For instance, I found one will from Venice dating to 1300 in which a priest leaves his bre to his niece, his mudande, which might not only be an indication that women wore such garments as a matter of course, but that in 1300 they were not necessarily terribly different from the version worn by men in that same place and time. Might also be an indication that bre, mudande, were a bit of a luxury item in certain social classes of that era, because otherwise why would you bequeath them onward to your heirs? For the ultimate in clarity about women wearing underwear in this era, documents such as dowries and trousseau registries can provide some fascinating details. And once I discovered further Latin terminology, suddenly I had a surfeit of evidence of women in Italian city-states owning underpants. The respective word here is interlula, or interulis, or intercula, and the other declensions of that word, depending on your grammatical structure. Anyway, in 1400, for instance, in Venice, one Aviano Nicolosio di Domenico registered the dowry he'd received for his son's wife. The entry in the archives details every single item of her biancheria, her linen undergarments. And this one specifies that she had tres interculas novas e veteres, three pairs of trues, new and old. As the new bride was a young woman, it is highly unlikely that these garments were intended to address the incontinence of old age, making this proof of young, healthy women wearing underpants in the Middle Ages, at least in a specific time and place thereof. Further searches using the term interulas or interculas have resulted in additional unambiguous evidence, specifically in the Italies. For instance, the trousseau of Antonio Gacitano, registered in 1476, features interulas tres muliebres, three pairs of women's underwear. I feel that's pretty unambiguous, as much as that statement might have me crucified in the comments. The upside is which, that all engagement is good engagement on YouTube. What a world we live in. When it comes to revealing the otherwise unrevealable about clothing, guild statutes represent another titillating glimpse into the past. The ordinances of the guilds of Paris from 1350 specifically state that, quote, tailors making male robe linge in the common fashion should be paid air denier. Some fashion historians interpret the term robe linge as being a synonym for bre, and if there's a male version specifically mentioned, then that must imply that there is a female version, of course. In that same line item, they mention a woman's shirt for four derniers, so robe linge might just be a synonym for shirt in this case. But interesting that a woman's costs so much less when normally a woman's shirt should actually contain more fabric than a man's shirt and require therefore more effort. So aside from engaging in exciting activities such as will trolling, I've also been pouring through rollicking action adventures such as medieval dictionaries, and I've made a very interesting discovery in the Catholicon published in 1380. This work defines the word feminale as meaning bre du femme, and the word femorale as brea homme, 
which would seem to imply that women must have worn them pretty commonly if female bre had their own term in Latin, one that was given its own entry in an expensive medieval dictionary from the late 14th century. Laws can also reveal a great deal about society's practices in general. In terms of women in truce, certain polities had sumptuary regulations requiring the unholy trinity of medieval immorality, that being prostitutes, actresses, and acrobats, to wear underpants. Some people have interpreted such rules as indicating that only marginal and socially unacceptable women were underwear as a sign of their sinfulness. But is that the only interpretation or even necessarily a valid one? Requiring these women to wear underwear certainly cannot have been for the same reason as other sumptuary laws, which were intended to visibly demarcate these dishonorable women from the good damsels and matrons of the community. Not even prostitutes walked around with their bray showing. In fact, Prostitutes were often required to wear more clothing, bundling themselves up in voluminous mantles and hoods. There must therefore have been another reason why communities felt the need to legislate the wearing of undergarments for these particular groups of women. As far as many medieval communities were concerned, there was practically no distinction between these classes of women, and it was said that actresses and acrobats were just a type of prostitute with a greater range of professional offerings, shall we say. I actually believe this legislation indicates that these classes of women were likely to not wear underpants because of the nature of their work. And pardon me as I speak somewhat indelicately here. Not having Bre in the way would facilitate their professional tasks by making the relevant parts more accessible to their clientele, speaking about prostitutes specifically. By requiring prostitutes to wear Bre, the various polities could have well been limiting the occasion for them to provide services, making it harder to render sexual services on a street, for instance, and requiring service provider and client to retreat to a more secluded area and remove certain key items, shall we say. This may have been an attempt to make prostitution less convenient and therefore less desirable as either a career field or a product. Now, I'm completely conjecturing on this score, mind you. My research is ongoing. As for requiring female acrobats to wear underwear, I think that's fairly obviously intended to ensure that the relative bits were covered during performances, which to my mind is an indication that covered female genitalia were the more modest and desired outcome rather than the idea that underpants were salacious. It could well be though that as the centuries passed, the wearing of underpants in women came to be associated with prostitutes and performers because of these modesty laws and retroactively developed the reputation of being a salacious garment, perhaps leading to the dying out of the custom amongst so-called respectable women in certain regions, if indeed the custom did truly die out. Now that being said, if you actually have to pass a law that requires an acrobat to wear underpants, a female acrobat to wear underpants, that could mean that women weren't typically wearing them and so they had to specify that in this case the women must. So you know, again, open to interpretation. And even the lack of documentary evidence in some regions can be easily explained by the fact that across medieval Europe, the ladies of the house were often in charge of making their own underthings, and often even those of their male relatives, which means that they did not have to order them from outside craftsmen. This practice applied even at the upper echelons of society. For instance, Alessandra Strozzi writes to her sons frequently in their exile in Rome and talks about making them undershirts. So this means that documents such as account books would lack entries for female bre, but still have them for men, especially men who did not have women folk to make their garments for them, or whose women folk had more important things to do than make all the underpants for both themselves and their men folk. No dainty women folk idling away in towers in this actual period of history, no matter what the Victorians might wanted you to believe. Right. Enough dusty books. Let us move on to the practical observations from years of medieval living history, both going commando and wearing and using 15th century style braids. Trigger warning. This may get a little graphic in the discussion of female anatomy, but nothing that would violate community standards. So you've been warned. I've been falling down the rabbit hole of medieval recreation for nearly 27 years, starting as a very freshly minted teenager in a proto-internet era in which the web consisted of nothing but porn and chat rooms. There was almost no useful information available on the internet back then, and in fact not much useful that had even been published or that was accessible at any rate in my rural little southern Delaware hometown. And yet, conventional wisdom at that time said that women in the Middle Ages did not wear underpants nor did I question the convention, assuming the matter as settled. And so, I spent nearly the first 17 years of my reenactment life under that paradigm, 
living for weeks at a time in medieval encampments, wearing layers of gowns that dragged on the ground, walking miles and miles a day, dancing all night, sweating up a storm. And by the end of the evening, not only were my legs so repulsive from all the cake dust, even at completely indoor sites with nicely paved floors, that I had to bathe before climbing into bed or disgust myself into insomnia. You would be amazed at how efficiently 15th century gowns vacuum up all the fine particulate matter into the vacuum bag that seems to form around one's legs. And not just my legs, the juncture of my legs was always crusted with sweat, dirt, creating an absolutely awful combination. And so, a pre-bed basin bath happened every single night without fail at such events. And then, the Langberg finds were published and word went out that there was a pair of Bray among them that could possibly be female. And so, I hastened to manufacture a pair based on the originals. Not a perfect reproduction in terms of dimensions and ratios, I adjusted them to fit me and my body more comfortably. But they still fit with the visual representations of the style of trues that I could find. And lo, even though my legs were still rather dirty at the end of any given day of medievalist activity, my nether legions were perfectly lovely. Okay, well maybe not lovely, but you get the gist. What a massive improvement in hygiene. In terms of the practicality of wearing these underpants under three to four layers of dresses, I experienced no more difficulties than not wearing the braid. Utilizing the latrine was no more or less complicated, really. Honestly, managing all the various folds of fabric, the two meters of train, the henin, the veil, all more complicated than removing, settling, and putting back on braid. Simply undo the one side, and in the original Langberg pair, it indeed seems that there are only ties on the one side, and let the other side hang on my thigh. Then, when I stand up, I just tie the other side back on, no struggle at all, and only slightly more work than wearing no panties at all, which I also did for many years, remember. But with my level of high-paced activity, the difference in hygienic outcomes is immense. And when it is that time of the month, the braille help protect my undergarments and serve as a fine support for class. I've actually heard some reenactors and fashion historians claim that women just bled out into their smocks, and that this was the purpose of the smock. I think not on so many levels, aside from that being disgusting. I mean, just physically would feel awful. So I'm not going to just bleed freely into my nice white smock and let those stains do what they will. Uh-uh, not happening. Well, there you have it. And that's not even all of the supporting evidence I've uncovered. And will no doubt continue to uncover as time goes on as a, and as I continue to plunge down rabbit holes. So where do you stand on the debate? Let me know in the comments. Otherwise, stay creative and stay tuned for your moment of non-underpants related kitty zen. Okay, the cat the cat did go back to sleep with Eli. We're just going to leave them there and see how long they stay like that. <laughs>